Now comes a difficult stretch drive to the Pac-12 championship game. Welcome to the Voice of College Football Talk in Oregon Ducks. We've got Eric Scopel on the line from Duck Territory. We would ask that you please like this video, share the videos out on social media, and subscribe. Get on over to Duck Territory. Get yourself primed for Oregon and Washington. Eric, how you doing today? Not too bad. We're just talking about it. Sounds like uh, you got a little bit more weather over there that, uh, than we do over here. It's a little, it's a little cold. Yeah, it's been beautiful. I can't complain. We're two weeks into November and it's like 68 degrees and it's been pretty consistently like that, but it's hitting here soon. All right. Well, this stretch drive for Oregon, my goodness, um, I was sizing up playoff contenders uh, from a one loss standpoint. And uh, wow, it starts this weekend with Washington. It's Utah, it's Oregon State, then a Pac-12 championship game. So four quality opponents to test this Ducks team. So if they get through that, uh, they will have earned whatever they, whatever the reward is on the, at the end. Yeah. I think if you want to poke holes in Oregon's resume right now, it's, it's pretty fair because you look at who they've beaten aside from UCLA and you can probably say Washington state and BYU are like solid teams, teams that we thought more highly of when Oregon beat them. They've really just kind of beaten up on the bottom dwellers in the conference since. And there's a huge gap this year from like the top six to the bottom six. Um, I think there's only been one win from the bottom six over the top six all conference play. Uh, I think that was Arizona State over Washington uh, last month. So it's not like Oregon has beaten a lot of the top teams with the exception of that UCLA win. But they're going to be tested right here. And I think it's encouraging if you are an Oregon fan and you're optimistic about how this will play out that they're sixth right now. Um, in the college football playoff ranking, because as I said, not a lot of great wins to kind of hang your hat on. They have the big one over UCLA. The rest of it's pretty, pretty meager, but there is going to be a lot of opportunity this month, starting with number 25, Washington. Then they host Utah next week. That'll be a top 12 or so team. Oregon State could be ranked again by the time they play up in Corvallis to, to right around Thanksgiving. And that could be three straight and then conference championship game, assuming Oregon wins and it, these games and is in it, would also be against I would imagine a USC, a UCLA, one of those teams, and that's going to be another team in the top 10, top 12, probably, depending on how things play out. So if you're Oregon, you have all of these opportunities coming up to, to prove you deserve to be in that college football playoff. I don't think there's another team that they're competing with um, that has that kind of run of games. I mean, Tennessee has basically played all of its best games on its schedule, and they played much tougher schedule, beating a lot better teams than Oregon has. And yet Oregon will have an opportunity to at least prove that it deserves to be in that conversation with a team like Tennessee, who I don't think anyone expects to lose from here. Um, and we can get into other teams to compare heads up against. But Oregon, I think, down the stretch probably has, you could make an argument, the toughest schedule of any of these teams in the top eight or so in the, in the college football playoff rankings. Yeah, from here on out, no question about that. Um, when we look at the Washington matchup, of course, uh, the Huskies are coming off a close one against Oregon State. Uh they, they have dropped into the top 25, as you just mentioned, um, at seven and two. Uh, what, what do you see out of the Huskies and what, what do you feel are key matchups coming up Saturday? Well, Washington does the one thing offensively that Oregon has struggled to defend. And that's the pass. I mean, that's the pass. And it, it's it's pretty telling that you're looking at the nation's most prolific pass offense against one of the nation's worst pass defenses. And this is where, if you're an Oregon fan, this is not a great matchup. This is a, this is a concern and should be a concern. Washington throws the football a, a ton, about 45 pass attempts per game. Oregon has been better, I would have said, going into the Cal-Colorado games. Prior to that, I would have said Oregon's been pretty darn good against the pass um, compared to where it started the season. But they got hit a couple times deep by Cal, a couple times deep by Colorado, one time really deep by Colorado for an 81-yard touchdown. And so that's a concern because Washington undoubtedly has better quarterbacks than or a better quarterback than either Cal or Colorado do and better skill players. And, and they're going to test you down the field over and over and over again. And so it's on Oregon secondary to defend against. It. And the interesting thing is, like I said, they've been pretty decent in that regard most of the season in terms of not a lot of offenses had been able to take the top off. But you saw Cal and you saw Colorado do it in consecutive weeks where you kind of have to go, OK, if Washington's going to stick around in this game and make it competitive, it's going to be through that. And how confident are you in Oregon's ability to, to defend it? And, and the one last week was a complete coverage bust. I mean, it was just that no, nobody was on that side of the field, basically. And a guy ran 
unguarded, um, undefended down the sideline um, for an easy touchdown. So it's, it's making sure you shore that up, but it's also making sure that, Hey, like you recognize that these guys are going to throw the football a ton. And for Oregon, it's making tackles in space, it's improving in coverage and it's getting stops on third down, uh, which has not been the strength of this defense. Uh, offensively, I think Oregon will be like Oregon's on a run right now, of 40 points every game. I don't know if I expect that to change this week. I think Washington's defense has been solid, but certainly not this type of defense that, you know, Chris Peterson and even Jimmy Lake the last couple of years kind of could, you know, the, the NFL talent has largely disappeared, or at least the top tier guys. I think Oregon's going to be able to move the ball offensively. It's just a question of can they can they slow a Washington pass offense, which again does the one thing Oregon doesn't do very well defensively. Got Eric Scopel on the line to talk Oregon Ducks, preparing for a big game with Washington at home at Autzen Stadium as the 13 and a half point favorite. You can join Eric at Duck Territory on 247 Sports. Of course, we got to talk about Bo Nix. He's got 35 touchdowns accounted for, and there's still four games left in the season if there's a conference championship game. So we know that Hendon Hooker ran into probably the best defense in the country and may have taken a step back uh, in his Heisman candidacy. C.J. Stroud ran into the wind at Northwestern and (laughs) his numbers suffered. I don't know how voters are going to look at that. It was an awful day, but then again, it was an awful day. (laughs) So uh, Bo Nix just keeps compiling statistics and numbers. And uh, again, Oregon, despite the opponent's Eric has the reputation nationally as, okay, the Georgia game is whatever you want to interpret it versus what it could be today, and this team is red hot. Yeah, and can they correct you? It's 36 combined touchdowns because he caught a pass for a touchdown last game. Oh, yes, he did last week, yes. We have to throw that in there. Um, You know, it's so so strange the way this has gone down because I I imagine we talked shortly after the Georgia game about kind of the fan base and kind of the feeling in Eugene about Bo Nix, and it was not warm and cuddly. You know, it was kind of like, oh, boy, like, was this really the right choice? What what if we just stuck with Ty Thompson? Why did we bring this guy out here? And that has completely changed. I mean, he is a rock star in Eugene. He went over to Matthew Knight Arena to to support the men's basketball team in their, their, uh, their season debut on Monday and was, you know, a huge line signing autographs. They put him up on the Jumbotron. People lost, lost their minds. I mean, it is, I don't want to say it's Bo Nix mania, but this is the kind of quarterback that Oregon has not had since Justin Herbert left. And statistically he's putting up a season far that surpasses anything Justin did here. You have to go back to Marcus Mariota who won the Heisman in 2014 to really find a quarterback season comparable to this. And, and frankly, he's probably on pace to have maybe a better season than that Mariota season. He's better in completion percentage. Um, he's already two touchdowns shy of what Mariota's single season rushing record for touchdowns are uh, by a quarterback, I should say. Uh, you know, the, the yardage stuff is pretty comparable. He's had opportunity, I think, to with some games down the stretch to have those big games. I don't know if he's going to win the Heisman. I don't know really kind of exactly where he is on a lot of voters minds but it has been interesting here because the conversation in september was is you know early september was is should they go to the freshman and now it's you know locally at least it feels like people are like is there there are not that many players that are better than him right now so the key for him is finishing this season is is not getting caught up in it and and not dropping a game or playing poorly i mean he really hasn't had a stinker this whole run is a thing that's really impressive like I think against Stanford, the completion percentage dipped a little bit, but he ran for like 120 yards and had an 80-yard touchdown. Every other game, I think his completion percentage has been over 70. He's had a couple over 80%. It's been super accurate, making really good decisions. Had a a couple turnovers uh, against Cal, but one of those came on an end of the half, just kind of heaped to the end zone where it's, you know, it's it's the least probable play to actually score points and probably the most probable to result in a turnover just because you're throwing it up in the air as far as you can to conclude a half so he's been really really good and again I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you he should be the Heisman or, or, or whatnot but I think statistically it's hard to argue um, that he's not been one of the better players in college football and especially during this run and if you want to get into the narratives there probably is a narrative to what he went through at Auburn coming to another location and then putting it all together like this or you could probably script something pretty good um, if you wanted to make the case. 
Eric, did you and everybody else know what this team was getting when Bucky Irving and Noah Whittington transferred? Because without them, I don't know where this rushing attack would be. No, it's funny. So Bucky committed when I was on a on a like a vacation. It, you know, I, I don't take my vacations until like after spring ball and like a week after he committed. And so I didn't get totally into the Bucky thing until a couple months later or not a couple months, a couple weeks later, maybe I was watching the highlights, talking to some people and there was a lot of excitement internally. I don't think externally there was much. And, and Whittington was a guy who arrived midway through spring practice. And I think the funny thing about this rush offense is the guy everybody was clamoring for was Byron Cardwell, who ran really well in a couple of games after C.J. Verdell got hurt last year as Travis Dye's backup and had a 100-yard game against Colorado, had some big runs to help seal the win over Washington last year. And I think there was the expectation from the fan base going into spring and into the fall of, like, this is going to be the next big running back. He's going to be the guy. And Cardwell hasn't played since Eastern Washington, uh, coaches say due to injury. He's at practice. He's not making road trips. You kind of wonder what the situation is there. I don't want to speculate. Everything I've heard is he's just hurt. But regardless, that was the guy everybody thought was going to be the big player. And it's been Irving and it's been Whittington without question. These are two of the more dynamic running backs on the West Coast right now. And I think Irving in particular, get an opportunity if you haven't to go watch the highlights. It's it's special stuff. I mean, his ability to change direction, his balance, his vision his uh just kind of instincts as a runner is is really unique from what Oregon has had of late and I think most people locally would say he's perhaps the most gifted just in terms of vision and sight you know and kind of suddenness that Oregon has had since like Michael James like he's that kind of a skilled back um you know the stats aren't completely there they're not comparable but that's in part because he's really splitting it with Whittington those guys are are basically almost in like a 55-45 time split. And then Bo carries the ball a bunch and gets – I mean, those two don't carry the ball near the, the red zone because Bo is either putting it in and then they, they have a true freshman who they bring in as a goal line back. So their touchdown numbers aren't maybe that impressive, but their ability in the rest of the field to, to make players miss and make plays has really been impressive. And you also can't discount what they've done in the past game. Yeah, I saw him play at Minnesota quite a bit, but didn't really realize how good he was because Mo Ibrahim is the guy there. And then he got hurt and they just went through, as you well know, they got down to their fifth tail back there. And I forget where he was in the procession there, but they had such a good offensive line. They all were fairly productive or really productive. So mm -hmm. he was just kind of in that procession. Then he went to Oregon and I thought, okay, what's he going to do out there? Uh, I didn't expect this kind of... Uh, a breakthrough. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think Oregon fans are really excited by the fact that this is only his second year of college football and he will be here for at least another season after this. Eric, you described him as dynamic. Uh, Troy Franklin, hmm. when I see him play, that uh, that word comes to mind. Yeah, Troy has been a player that people did have expectations for. You know, we talked about those two running backs and kind of the uncertainty of kind of like, okay, we think it's going to be Byron. And then suddenly Byron's not in the rotation. And these guys are, you know, kind of having breakout seasons. Franklin was a guy who's the, I believe the second highest rated recruit at the receiver position Oregon has ever signed. Big time kid out of Northern California. Last year was slated to be this opening day starter, but suffered an injury, wasn't able to be uh, in the starting lineup, never really got his job back until there was a bunch of turnover at the position at the end of the season with injury and transfer. Um, and then this year has really stepped up as Bo's go-to guy. I don't think there's really any question. Chris Hudson has also played well of late, but uh, Franklin leads the team in all the receiving categories. And it's not, these aren't like empty stats. A lot of these plays are, are I think dynamics, the right word are really impressive. He's, able to stretch the, the field vertically, runs a great post route. He and Bo connected on half a dozen of those this year, probably for 40 or more yards. Um, you know, the, the catches on the sideline in the end zone, some of these acrobatic stuff really stands out. Um, they don't use him as much in the screen game, but when he does have the ball in the open field, like I think this last game against Colorado only had one catch, but and it, it went for 41 yards and probably, 25 of those 20 of those were open field making guys miss but broke about four tackles to put the ball close to the red zone he is he is a player that uh maybe is one of the more gifted receivers oregon's had in quite some time and this is a school that has had great quarterbacks great running backs a lot of offensive linemen tight end but you run through the offense haven't always really had like a, a top tier first or second day 
draft pick at receiver, really haven't had one. This is a guy who maybe could become that in a couple of years here when he's draft eligible after next season. I'll be kind of curious to see what his ceiling is. He's still pretty slight of frame, but dynamic player with the football. And, and again, I think is, is really difficult in terms of def- teams just really struggle to defend him and keep the ball out of his hands. And I think for Washington this weekend, it's going to be uh, Oregon's going to have to throw the football. I think Oregon's going to have to, to find ways to, to move the ball in, in different ways. And I think Franklin's going to be key in that. 